He followed this up by screaming, It's time to let yourself go right now! <laughs> Cause there are no mother rules out there! When this song kicks, I want you to f***ing kick in! <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, hello there. I'm your host, Simon Wams here. Danny writes me a script, Woodstock 99, When Peace and Love Turn Nasty. Isn't there a documentary on Netflix about this right now? <laughs> Is that why we're doing this? Because it's popular? This won't be released for, like, ages. I'm recording this in, like, early October. So, whenever you're watching this, this is probably really old news. Anyway, Danny writes it, I read it, Sam edits it. Let's go! Imagine being partly responsible for a legendary slice of cultural history. Don't have to imagine it, Danny. It's right here on Brain Blaze. Legendary slice of cultural history. I think that might change the banner on my channel to say that. I went on YouTube the other day and none of my banners were visible. And I was wondering, did they get rid of banners or was YouTube just having a weird day? I'll check that out later. And then actually ending up in massive debt from the whole enterprise. <laughs> so far, so good, old Brain Blaze. <laughs> Simon knows what that feels like. Oh, I make money. I say, I don't, you know, I don't do this for free. I'm getting paid. Oh, I know he likes to pretend that he makes a healthy living from his gloriously enlightening YouTube empire, but you don't see him cowering under the desk in fright when the bailiffs come knocking on the door. <laughs> Get the f out of here! <laughs> Michael Lang knows what it feels like, too. He was one of the four American entrepreneurs who helped put together the original Woodstock Festival in 1969, or the Woodstock Music and Art Fair, if we're using formal names. That sounds a lot less appealing. Billed as three days of peace and music, the Ibi extravaganza was a blissed out drug fueled two fingers to the establishment and the Vietnam War rooted in peace and love and lentils, set against the backdrop of a 600 acre dairy farm in Bethel, New York. Attracting the talents of Jimi Hendrix, The Who, Janis Joplin, Santana. Oh my god, how old is Santana? Is he really as old as these guys? I thought he was younger for some reason. How old are you? 17. How long have you been 17? A while. The Grateful Dead. Woodstock went down as one of the most celebrated and iconic festivals of the 20th century. So it's a shame that Michael and his young buddies ended up in debt to the tune of a million dollars. A million dollars in 1960s money? is a lot more than a million dollars today. There was an extended encore of reasons, including ever-spiraling setup costs, later compensation costs, and most notably of all, the fact that the organizers were forced to completely abandon the idea of ticket booths and change the event into a massive free-for-all. Well, yeah, when you, were pla when you plan an event, spend a lot of money on it, be like, and it's free! Of course you're gonna end up in debt, because you've spent all this money and you've made no money. It's like there is nothing more simple in business than that. Hippies. To be fair, they did eventually turn a profit around a decade later, helped along by revenue from the Oscar-winning documentary film and accompanying soundtrack. But now that Woodstock had evolved into such a symbolic countercultural brand, there was surely a golden opportunity here for revisiting the stage, tapping into the old 60s magic, and making a faster buck from music lovers who could actually afford to buy a ticket. It took 25 years for Michael Lang to pluck up the courage to have another crack at Woodstock 94. The second festival staged cracking performance from major league talents, but it was largely remembered for the massive overcrowding problems due to half of the visitors being gate crashers and the lousy weather which led to the whole site transforming into a giant mudslide. There's a festival. I don't know, I've never been to a music festival because I would hate it. But like, I think it's it's Glastonbury, right? Which is famously muddy. Like, it's like there's mud everywhere because it's the UK, it rains all the time. And it's in a big field. And it also lost another load of poor, for money for poor Michael, uh, which he never got back. <laughs> Dude, what are you doing? <laughs> you, you, didn't you learn the lesson the first time? If you bet, spend a lot of money and don't make any money, you're going to end up in debt. You did the same thing again. People gate crashed. You shouldn't have let that happen. You should have had, I don't know, tickets, Michael. Tickets. Undeterred, Michael Lang tried again just five years. Who is giving you the money to do this, Michael? Are you like... Uh, are you, like, born with money and uh, okay to just waste it all? Because holy sh**, surely no one is funding this or giving you money to do this. He hooked up with New Jersey promoter Scott Scher to put on Woodstock 99 to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the original festival. This time, things would be different. Held over four days in July 1999, this event would be a slick corporate affair with a proper ticketing system, tight security cash machines, email stations email stations what the f is that <laughs> licensed vendors and lucrative sponsorship from ntv who screened the whole event on pay-per-view for 60 dollars a pop 60 dollars a pop in 1999 money 
that's got to be at least 150 bucks. Right? What the f***? You can almost hear the ka noises before the festival even opened its gates. So let's see how this one turned out. The chosen location for Woodstock 99 was the decommissioned Griffiths Air Force Base in Rome, central New York, about 100 miles away from the original Woodstock's dairy farm site. It was presumably chosen because nothing says peace and love and pacifism more than a former military base that used to be swarming with B-52 bombers. 1999 must have been relatively peaceful, right? That's like post and pre those uh, like American peaceful. Post, I think there was war in Europe, right? Oh God, my European history, my history is sometimes embarrassingly bad. When was like the Bosnia and stuff going on? That was like around then, right? So like, but America was peaceful. It was like pre and post, it was like post and also pre Middle East adventures. I don't understand. I don't understand. Mindful of the ticketing fiascos that emerged in the preceding two events, the organizers erected a 12-foot security fence constructed from plywood and steel chain links. This sensitively named Peace Wall was intended to keep out the freeloading hairy riffraff and restrict access to those more affluent warrockers who had forked out the full $157 ticket price. I I mean, I get it. I get that the, you know, this is kind of like it's like, uh, you know, Woodstock, it's free and there's free love and all this shit. But it's like, yeah, but to put on an event, you do have to charge money. And you do have to stop people who haven't been charged money from getting in. It's just how life works. This isn't f***ing communism. That was a bit steep in 1999, especially considering that you were banned from bringing your own provisions and were forced to pay the extortionate prices charged by the unregulated on-site vendors if you happened to be getting a bit peckish or thirsty. They were demanding $12 for a slice of pizza, $4 for a small bottle of water. This seems outrageous in 2022. That's a f ton of money in 1999. A far cry from the original Woodstock, which had provided open kitchens and free grub. Yes, the original Woodstock, which left the founder a million dollars in debt. A million 1969 dollars! Still, the organizers must have been making a packet on this one. The production costs were reported to be around 38 million dollars, and an estimated 400,000 visitors flocked to the event. Getting out my trusty Sinclair pocket calculator for a second, I reckon that means they must have generated more than 60 million dollars in ticket sales alone. One minor discrepancy though, only 186,000 genuine tickets were ever actually sold. Fake tickets were a big part of the problem here, but it also has to be said that the Peace Wall wasn't quite as robust and impenetrable as the organizers as it hoped. Fake tickets are an interesting one. Not that I ever did this, certainly never, um, but when I was a student, <laughs> for some reason, the student union, I think because they thought that the people couldn't fake the tickets, would print out tickets to the various events on receipt paper. So you'd go there and you'd buy a ticket and it would cost like a few pounds and they'd print it out on like a receipt paper. You know that super thin like laser paper or whatever? But the problem was, allegedly, well, you could just go buy or steal from, you know, your mate's place of employment a roll of printer paper. And obviously you don't have the receipt printer because those are expensive. But you can just, allegedly, tape it down to a piece of A4 paper, like line that up on Microsoft Word and then just run that shit through a regular ass printer and uh, print yourself some, uh, some fake tickets. Not that that ever happened. I'm just saying. <laughs> FBI, open up! Again, Hitler. FBI. That turned out to be a stroke of good fortune in the long term, though. By the end of the event, more people were desperate to get out through the peace wall than had ever attempted to sneak in. The former Air Force base was only supposed to hold a capacity of 250,000 revelers, so the site was seriously overcrowded from the first day. Whereas visitors to the original Woodstock had set up camp in lush green fields, grass was in short supply at the Air Force base, forcing many guests to squeeze their tents into tight spots on hot tarmac and concrete. Oh, it wasn't just no grass, it was tarmac. That's horrible. Bearing in mind there were no trees or shade at the Air Force Base, let's hope the heat didn't get too intense. No, scrab that, there was a heat wave. <laughs> Temperatures reached 104 Fahrenheit, which is 40 fucking Celsius. Which meant that things were getting sticky out there. But I mean, they're sure going to sell a lot of those $4 water bottles, aren't they? And modern problems require modern solutions. The two main stages were four kilometers apart. So everyone was regularly having to hotfoot it across one and a half miles of scorching tarmac in one of the most challenging games of the floor is lava ever staged. And guests were getting thirsty. Remember when I mentioned that vendors were charging four dollars for a bottle of water? As demand for water reached frenzied levels, this rose sharply to twelve dollars a bottle. Just, I'm just gonna guess and say money is double now, like from 1999 to now. It's like twenty-four bucks a bottle. 
That's basically, uh, the, uh, right now, the exchange rate is so insane. That's basically like 24 quid. That's fucking mental. Your choice was to pay up or risk collapsing from dehydration before the weekend was out. Oh no, wait, there was another option. The festival had thoughtfully provided free water fountains around the site. One minor quibble here was that demand for free water was so great that 30-minute queues formed around them. And even when you did make it to the front of the queue, there was a much bigger quibble. The overflowing port were spreading human waste all over the site and even managed to get into the free fountains. Oh, Jesus Christ. This is a bad time. The drinking water was contaminated with urine and feces and unfit for human consumption. This coffee smells like shit. It is shit, Austin. The pricey bottle of water suddenly sounded a bit more appealing. Great jumping gobstoppers, I would have paid $12 for a plastic cup of Heineken at that point. By the second day, the whole site looked like a dump littered with empty beer bottles and discarded food packaging that were all melting under the baking sun and creating an unholy stench. Nobody seemed bothered about clearing up the mess, so guests just had to navigate their way over the ever-growing piles of stinky trash. But the human ex I'm not how does the human excrement get into the water supplies you got a water fountain it's not like taking water from the ground surely it's like taking water from pipes how are those pipes getting contaminated this is disgusting nice pipes Tamika. this is like the og fire festival but the human excrement, which continued to gush from the overflowing portaloos, was of particular concern. It's not that uncommon to see festival goers caked in mud during a rainy season, and Woodstock 99 was no exception, with hundreds of guests plastered from head to toe in the stuff. But hang on a minute, the weather was blazing hot, and it hadn't rained for weeks. What exactly was all this mud coming from? Oh no, and there's no water, it's just piss. It is shit, Austin. I am disgusted. It's perhaps not too surprising that people began to feel a bit queasy. The visitors started dropping like flies from heat exhaustion and dehydration. The ones who'd risked drinking from the fountains of filth ended up contracting trench mouth. What the f is trench mouth? A nasty gum infection which causes bleeding and swelling and ulcers and intense pain. F that. More commonly associated with World War I soldiers stuck in trench warfare without much access to dental hygiene. Oh my lord. The trenches and f this Woodstock place. Hundreds of guests spent a big chunk of time in the long queues snaking around the two medical tents, and the New York State Department of Health later reported that the festival had generated a grand total of 5,162 medical cases. Did anyone die? I get the feeling this has kind of got like someone's gonna die vibes, doesn't it? Still, minor trivialities aside, the guests had come here to enjoy the music, and a bit of a dehydration and trench mouth wasn't going to dampen their enthusiasm. Whereas the general music vibe of the original Woodstock had been a fusion of hippie folk and psychedelic rock, the 1999 version curiously opted to focus on the more angry heavy metal and new metal. The lineup included Limp Bizkit, Metallica, Megadeth, and Rage Against the Machine. These are fairly intense bands. <laughs> Although there were also a couple of surprising less shouty names, including Sheryl Crow and Alanis Morissette. I love Alanis Morissette, who appeared to have wandered onto the wrong bill. When Limp Bizkit took to the stage on Saturday night, there appeared to be a simmering atmosphere building in the hot and thirsty and smelly crowd, who were perhaps beginning to realize they had been ripped off even the ones who had snuck in for free. In between songs, lead singer Fred Durst had apparently been asked by organizers to try and diffuse the growing tension, but his subsequent message to the audience didn't really roll them in the right direction. He told them, they want to ask us to ask you to mellow out a bit. But I don't think you should mellow out. Mellowing out is what Alanis Morissette has you motherfuckers do. <laughs> Cut my life into pieces! That is Limp Bizkit, right? Please. No, that's, uh, oh no, that's that other band who are the same, but different. Oh, they all sound the fucking same, these, like, uh, late 90s. Cut my life into pieces! These, all these bands. Every song is that. Are you deaf? This is my last resort. This isn't really singing. I'm just shouting in a mic. Are you challenging me? Fred Durst may have been throwing shade at Alanis there. Yes, but at least Alanis is talented. Uh, but throwing shade at anyone would have been more than welcome under these blistering conditions. Danny. He followed this up by screaming, It's time to let yourself go right now. Because <laughs> there are no mother rules out there. When this song kicks, I want you to f***ing kick in. <laughs> Cut my life into pieces. Stop it. Get some help. 
The song in question was called Break Stuff, which the audience <laughs> it's <a> fucking awesome <laughs> to take his instruction from their wise leader. They started tearing down the sound towers and ripping apart the wooden fences around the stage, using the broken planks to crowd surf over other members of the increasingly bruised and battered audiences. When Fred was very briefly interviewed by MTV after the performance, it was questioned about the serious incidents unfolding in the crowd. Fred simply shrugged and said, This is my last resort no he said it's not our fault <laughs> i'm cracking myself up today and i'm hurting my voice good good things were much calmer over on one of the other stages during a set by fat boy slim mr slim aka norman <laughs> I had no idea what Fat Boy Slim's no regular name was, but Norman Cook would be the opposite of what I would guess. Like, literally, a name like Jeff Jones would be less, like, boring than Norman Cook. No offense, Mr. Slim. I actually quite enjoy some of your music. I'm trying to think of a single thing you've done, but I know I like some of it. <laughs> One hour later. Nope. <laughs> it's a Fat Boy Slim, right? Right? He noticed something unusual in the audience, which he initially thought to be some kind of white floating platform carrying around 30 people on top of it. In fact, it was a stolen white van plowing right through the audience. In the interest of safety, Norman thought it might be a good idea to pause the set until the shit was sorted out, and his reward for this thoughtful gesture was to get pelted with rocks and bottles. He was just what, <laughs> was a bit harsh. When security personnel eventually managed to stop the van, they made a very disturbing discovery. In the back of the vehicle was a drugged, unconscious, and semi-naked girl of around 15 or 16 who had allegedly been gang-raped by all the men hanging off the vehicle. What the f turn did this just take? And this brings us to the darkest side of Woodstock 99. Danny! <laughs> you can't let me go from that to this! <laughs> Jesus. Over the course of four days, there were multiple eyewitness accounts of sexual assault and rape, including another gang rape in the audience during a performance by Korn. Only five of the sexual assaults were reported to the police, and I couldn't dig up any evidence of a single successful prosecution. Promoter John Shah delivered a stomach-turning response when he challenged about when challenged about the rapes that took place during the festival. He said, It got painted by journalists as if people were getting raped every 15 feet. It just wasn't. I'm not denying that it did happen. I'm just saying the nature of journalism is to find the story that people will want to read, not diminishing in any way, shape, or form the women that, you know, got exploited. Honestly, mate, it kind of sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. <laughs> it sounds like you're saying one sentence, and then saying something completely different, and then saying something else, and then saying something completely different. It sounds like, allegedly, you're a bit of a cock. He later added, I'm critical of the hundreds of women that were walking around with no clothes on, and expecting not to be touched. You could f*** right off, mate. <laughs> what the f*** are you on about? <laughs> Keep an eye on that man, allegedly. You know, <laughs> if there's a dude who's gonna, you know, it's like something sh** people said. It's like, I just wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, there were some allegations <laughs> later, right? Allegedly, in my opinion. Yeah, he's not denying that women were raped, but it wasn't every five minutes, and it wasn't all the fault. And it was all the fault of the women anyway. No. So what's all the fuss about? This idiot still works in the entertainment industry today. Idiot in Danny's opinion and my opinion, but these are just opinions. A big part of the problem here was the broadly useless security. Although a relatively small number of New York State troopers were supposedly on patrol, the majority of the responsibility was dumped on the shoulders of young volunteers who were paid $500 to walk around the site with yellow t-shirts bearing the words Peace Patrol. They simply weren't trained or equipped to deal with the unfolding maelstrom, and it's reported that many of them actually joined in the very things they were paid to prevent. Let's break some shit in here! Over a hundred of these junior sentries were so fed up by the end of the first night that they gave up and sold their yellow shirts to other revelers on the promise of backstage perks. By the end of the very last night, pretty much everyone at the festival was ready to give up and go home, but there was one final spicy firework that was waiting to be lit. I wanna go! Red Hot Chili Peppers had the dubious honor of bringing the festival to a close on Sunday night. During this final performance, the anti-gun violence organization PAX came up with a nice idea of distributing tens of thousands of candles which were meant to be lit during the band's rendition of Under the Bridge to mourn the victims of the Columbine High School shooting which had taken place just three months earlier. Introducing fire to this situation does not seem like the brightest of moves. I mean, other than it's going to be very, very bright when all that sh** catches on fire. It's going to be fly away on my Zephyr. He's going to be like, I'm flying away on my Zephyr from this fire because f <laughs> That's a terrible joke. That's like, I, I quite like that, that, uh, 
Red Hot Chili Peppers are kind of shit and good at the same time, aren't they? They're one of those bands where it's like, wow, that's a cracking song. This is really good. I like that. And then you listen to it too much and you're like, this is actually shit. And then you listen to some of their other music and you're like, this is actually shit. And then there's some stuff that you just genuinely like. Like, really is really, really good. Red Hot Chili Peppers. Good and shit at the same time. Wow. By the way. <laughs> That was an album of my teens, that that was. Uh, what was it called? By the way, was that the name of the album or just the lead song? That was a good album. And shit at the same time. <laughs> this must have seemed like another good idea beforehand, as it was actually a respectful nod to Jimi Hendrix's performance of the song during his own closing set at the original Woodstock. But we're now left with a situation in which tens of thousands of largely disgruntled festival visitors were left holding lit candles as Red Hot Chili Peppers pumped out fire. <laughs> it was the... <laughs> I don't know that song. <laughs> it was the spark that pretty much ignited an epic blaze. Bonfires began breaking out in the crowds as the audience seemed determined to raise everything to the ground. The sound towers were attacked and toppled to the floor. Vehicles were flipped over. Trucks were set on fire and ATMs were ransacked and destroyed. <laughs> ah! As thieves got away with an estimated $22,000. Fuck, man. I mean, you got to pay for those water bottles, don't you? Vendors were smashed to pieces in one last protest at the robbing bastards charging $12 for bottled water to dangerously dehydrated guests. Although state troopers eventually got this full-scale riot under control, Griffiths Air Force Base was left looking like it had taken a serious hit by forces deadlier than it had ever faced during military conflict. But at least the peace wall was now broken to bits, allowing most visitors to make a hasty escape from Woodstock 99 as the flames from the final curtain were finally extinguished. Whereas most attendees of the original Woodstock had returned home with fond memories and fresh hope for a more peaceful future, the attendees of Woodstock 99 had returned home with black eyes and cigarette burns on their forehead. Some didn't make it back home at all. A 44-year-old man with a heart condition had died on the campgrounds on the first night. A 28-year-old man died in the mosh pit during Metallica's performance from what the doctors believed to be hypothermia, probably secondary to heat stroke and a 28 year old woman was knocked over and killed by a car while attempting to flee the chaos my joke about the being like deaths now now feels distasteful because oh my god people actually died weirdly michael lang initially seemed quite unfazed by all of this he claimed that the festival had gone down a storm and that people were only rioting at the end because they didn't want the fun to stop in later years when michael lang and john sure all weren't pointing the finger at each other for the disaster they were blaming the bands and the unruly crowd who were described as irresponsible aggressive and anarchic it's a fair point that this was probably a very different bunch of the peace loving beatniks who had attended the original woodstock in 1969 to listen to janis joplin well yeah but you invited metallica and what did you expect? The Limp Biscuit dude was like, let's break sh right now! What did you expect? During this 1999 version, everyone was drip fred an aggressive menu of new metal whilst, whilst melting under the unpleasant conditions and facing a stark choice of drinking shitty water from a fountain or getting ripped off by unscrupulous vendors. It's little wonder that peace and love had evolved into rage and hate. Of course, some of the most truly appalling violations to have taken place at Woodstock 99 were irrefutably indefensible, even under the most extreme of circumstances. Some of these attendees were monsters. But it's worth bearing in mind that the overwhelming majority of the 400,000 visitors were surely just there to have a good time. It only takes a significant minority of a crowd to, to create a crisis. However, Michael Lang and John Shear completely evaded any responsibility at their end. This alleged tribute to the original three days of piece of music was little more than a greedy corporate cash grab where profits took priority over looking after the fleeced guests. The venue was entirely unsuitable and the scorched concrete and tarmac came cheap. The unregulated vendors were allowed to take the piss and charge exorbitant prices for basics such as food and water. They skimped on sanitation and trash services and waste management, leading to a situation where the site became a dumping ground and everyone was caked in sewage. And they skimped on vital security, preferring instead to hand out yellow t-shirts to teenage music fans and get them to play at being police. Still, while we don't know the exact figures, Michael Lang is likely to have made a few million dollars out of this one. So at least the event was a highly profitable disaster. It's often argued that it was a mistake to even attempt to recreate the peace and love vibes of 69 in a world that had very much moved on. But perhaps even the original Woodstock wasn't quite as joyful and chilled out as everyone seems to remember. Some of the sets at the 69 festival were ruined by torrential rain and technical difficulties. There were multiple allegations of rape, 742 drug overdoses, bloody hell, and two deaths involving one unlucky 17-year-old who was trying to grab 40 winks on a hayfield and ended up getting run over by a tractor. Surprisingly, Michael Lang tried to get another Woodstock off the ground in 2019, this time to celebrate the 50th anniversary. Stop it, Michael. Stop it. 
Stop it, you've been trying this for too long and it's not working. But the efforts came to nothing. As Michael passed away in January 2022, it's perhaps unlikely that we'll ever revisit Woodstock in the future. And might I say good? Uh, and that may well be for the best. Just leave the whole wretched idea alone and let everyone enjoy a bit of peace. Man. Thank you for watching. This is my last resort. This isn't really singing. I'm just shouting in a mic.